G'day and welcome. I'm Infinite Reality, so are you, and so are all of us. And today I'm going into part two of my expose on Cecil Rhodes and his effect long after he died, which probably spanned into a part three as well. But we'll see how we go. Okay, let's continue. British colonizer Cecil Rhodes came to Southern Africa. Rhodes was an ideological colonizer. He believed in British imperialism and promoted it. He said to prevent war you must become an imperialist. Well, uh, I'd argue that uh, it's caused more wars than prevented. But anyway, he created the Rhodes Scholarship. Yes, he did. And that's something I'm going to go to in detail a little later. His goal was to install British imperialism from Cape Town to Cairo, built the Cape Cairo Railway. His vision was part of the British Empire in which they boasted the sun never set because it went around the world. Yes, absolutely, and that's another thing I'm going to go in, into in part three, uh, how it affected um, British foreign policy. The British Empire included 77 countries, including India and 15 countries in Africa. 458 million people were oppressed in this empire, one quarter of the world's population, and at the time under British colonials, colonialism. At that time, England had the highest standard of living in the world based on the near starvation of the people in Africa, India and other countries. Yeah. Uh, because they raped and pillaged uh, not only the the mineral wealth of these countries, but they uh, they stole the food too. Cecil Rhodes was a perpetrator of genocide. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Responsible for the displacement of millions of African people for the benefit of white settlers and enslavement of African people in their own land. White people came from Europe and became wealthy from the theft of the gold and diamonds in Southern Africa. And that goes back to uh, part one in this series, right at the very start where I saw the, uh, I put a picture up of the Queen uh, walking through, you know, pretty much a mountain of gold, store, stored reserves of gold, and uh, what that, actual, that meme actually said, you know, and it's absolutely true. That's where she got her gold from. Make no mistake. Cecil Rhodes founded the De Beers Diamond Cartel. Rhodes went to South Africa from Britain when he was 18 years old. He took over the diamond mines at Kimberley, South Africa and others in the area. By his early 20s he was a millionaire, but he did not retire. He believed in subjugating Africa for the benefit of England. Yeah, absolutely. His, his um, ideals were of a eugenics nature. He wanted to uh, supplant the black man for the white man. You know, make no mistake about it, this guy was an evil piece of shit. Rhodes went to Zimbabwe, the land of the Matabele and Shona, who launched fierce resistance led by the leader Lobangula. Rhodes paid a mercenary army from England and stocked them with the Maxim machine guns. With just five machine guns, the English slaughtered 5,000 African people in one afternoon alone, and they celebrated with dinner and champagne. Well, something very similar happened uh, <coughs> in India uh, in the peaceful protest that Gandhi uh, had happening. They mowed down that many people, it wasn't even funny, you know, and all they were talking about was uh, salt. Funnily enough, uh, that they they, uh, they protested against the taxation on salt. 
So what did the British Army do? Came in and mowed everyone down that was there. Women, children, everyone. Disgusting policies from Britain. Uh, from Britain, uh, Britain. Winston Churchill and Baden-Powell Boy Scouts. Cecil Rhodes, gay, he said. Thoroughly enjoying the outing. Saw the slaughter of Africans as sport and adventure. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. This is the way they looked at this stuff. They, they looked at, at uh, people that had uh, black skin colour as subhuman. Absolutely disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. The, the, the Chokwe, Shona and Zulia people were amongst those who led the powerful struggles against the European invasions. Yeah, you, you, ever watched the movie Zulu? That, that gave you a very good indication of how much they put up a fight. You know, uh, yes, it's only a movie, but yes, it's also based on fact. Cecil Rhodes helped set up the apartheid system in South Africa and the past laws based on Jim Crow laws of the United States. Yes, see, see the effect that, that this man had on things to come well after his death. You know, well after his death. It, it, it's astounding the amount of influence he had on foreign policy. And, uh, you know, it, people need to understand this today. Because some of the things that he put into place way back then have ramic ramifications today. And big ones. And that's something I'll probably get into in part three. Uh, past laws, colonial taxation of African people to force them to work to be used as near slave labour in the diamond mines. Yeah, look, he, he didn't give a shit. He just did it. Africans in the diamond mines were forced to stay away from family and wife in compounds with only cold tea and bread. Oh, he's a generous fucker. Yeah, really generous. Much the same conditions today. When Cecil Rhodes died, the De Beers Diamond Cartel was taken over by the Oppenheimer family. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, these very rich people sort of keep all this stuff in place for themselves, isn't it? <coughs> the atrocities that took place in Sierra Leone and West Africa, where what De Beers itself has done to African people for a hundred years, on these Africans with cans, body cavity searches, Zulu forced to pull rickshaw for owners. You know, once very proud people are turned to serfs. You know, no pride in, in their life. <sighs> Disgusting. Diamonds have long played a role in the neo-colonialism in Africa. Mobutu's villa in the Riviera, his diamonds, Mobutu, one of the richest men in the world, which says something about the worth of the resources in Congo, CIA worked with Kennedy, Eisenhower and De Beers to assassinate Lumbumba. Or Lumumba. Yeah, well, of course, anyone that wants to stand up to it, just let's kill them. Let's kill them. Cecil Rhodes and the cult of eugenics. The British East India Company modelled on the older Levant Company of Venice. See, there's, there's a big story right there. Venice. Um, you've got to understand the, the history of banking to understand where all this stuff came from, right? And Venice has a big part to play. You, you could um, uh, read a book called uh, Babylon's Banksters and a man called Joseph P. Farrell will actually go right into the role of Venice in the banking. Uh, I'm not the kind of person to actually elucidate on it, but uh, I do know a fair bit about it. Uh, but it's not really the place to be talking about it at the moment, so I'll move on. Yeah, Levant Company of Venice had been raping India since the early 1700s, but it wasn't until 1763 that his Venetian factions 
was able to seize control over the empire as a whole. It was the rapacious looting policies of this faction that forced the American colonies to declare their independence. Right, so you're starting to see that the forces at work here, the people that, that disagreed with, with these colonial policies, decided to go their own way. You know, um, because, uh, well, lest they be next. You know, really, lest they be next. British imperialist Cecil Rhodes, founder of the British Round Table, set out to establish institutions which would ensure that his white supremacist policies would outlive him. After the American Revolution, the British launched a renewed drive against India, completely conquering the subcontinent by first years of the new century. It was in this period that the opium trade, for which India was a linchpin, became the dominant pursuit of the empire. Yes, and what did they do with that opium? You know, look up the opium wars and what they did to China. You know, their, their end goal was to control the whole world. You know, and guess what? Nothing's changed now. We, we, have, we have this term called the New World Order today. And this is, this is where it stems from. After Lincoln's victory came the Confederacy in the American Civil War, and even more so after the 1876 centennial celebration it became clear that the united states could not be conquered militarily the british responded by launching the pseudoscience of eugenics and also the round table movements of cecil rhodes and lord alfred milner yeah uh let let's uh mention darwin charles darwin in that uh he had a big part to play survival of the fittest well who was the fittest the white man, you know, uh, let's let's not mince words here. Th this is why um, the origin of the species was put out. It was propaganda. Okay, in 1880s and 1890s, this elite movement created the Eugenic Society, founded by Sir Arthur Balfour of the Venetian origin Cecil family. Uh, I'll go into that man later. John Ruskin, pre-Raphaelite uh, Brotherhood, opposed to the entire European Renaissance. Yeah, f funny that. You know, when you have the best of uh, everything coming out of Europe, you've always got to have someone oppose it, haven't you? The round table of Cecil Rhodes, Alfred Milner, Balfour and their friends strategists from the African and Asian Empire seeking world power for the Anglo-Saxon master race. Yep, that's, what, that's about the crux of it. These men shared and bored contempt for the existence of mankind like the satanic Zeus of Asephius, Prometheus bound. Their idea was to convince the United States to join them in their quest for Anglo-Saxon world government. Well, they didn't really have a bar of that. It wasn't until later that they were corrupted. The round table of Cecil Rhodes was centred on the imperialist networks of South Africa, which later spawned raw material monoliths such as Rio Tinto Zinc, Anglo-American, Lonro and De Beers. Yeah, uh, Rio Tinto is a big name in mining today. I've spoken about it in previous... Uh, videos. There was this inhuman cabal which ran the Boer War, conducted genocide against the black population, later set up a horrendous apartheid regime. One of the wealthiest, most influ influential and evil men of his day, Rhodes was a virulent racist, or as he and his friends teamed it, a race patriot, who wrote in a document called Confession of Faith. It goes on to say, I contend that we are the finest race in the world and that the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. Just fancy those parts that are present inhabited by the most despicable specimens of human beings. What an alteration there would be if they were brought under Anglo-Saxon influence. Look again at the extra employment a new country added to our dominions gives. I contend 
that every acre added to the territory means in the future birth to some more of the English race who otherwise would not be brought into existence. So what he's saying, um, by raping and pillaging uh, these countries and getting rid of the actual uh, native population of these countries, that we can actually sustain more white people in, in the world. That's what he was saying. You know, disgusting human being this man was. Absolutely disgusting. Let's continue. Added to this, the absorption of greater portion of the world under our rule simply means the end of all wars. Oh, really? Oh, really? So, no matter, as long as you kill everyone that disagrees with you, that'll be the end of all wars after that. Not at all, because there's always going to be someone that disagrees. Always. This moment, we had not lost America. I believe we should have stopped the Russian-Turkish war by merely refusing money and supplies. Having these ideas, what scheme could we think of to forward this object? Why should we not form a secret society? Now, that's going into the next part that I want to talk. But with one object, the furtherance of the British Empire and the bringing of the whole uncivilised world under British rule, for the recovery of the United States and for the making of the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire. Hey, he was ambitious. I'll give him that. He was ambitious. Africa is still lying ready for us. It is our duty to take it. Oh, really? A duty to take it? A duty. Wow. It is our duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory, and we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes, that more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, most honourable race the world possesses. Well, if they're anything like you, Cecil Rhodes, and I'm a white man myself, but I do not agree with any of this. This is disgusting. Over the course of his life, Rhodes commissioned seven wills to be written, all expressing this same purpose. His fortune was to be used for setting up Rhodes Trust and Rhodes Scholarship as means of recruiting American and Commonwealth Anglophiles into the Imperial faction. Absolutely. And this is what I'm going to get into a bit later on. Uh, that was what it was initially set up as, right? He wanted to get like-minded individuals and put them in power, uh, positions of power. And you can see the remnants of it to this day. You will find Rhodes Scholars in politics and banking all over the world. You know, and they, trust me, they believe in this imperialistic beliefs. They really do. Let us form the same kind of a society, a church, for the extension of the British Empire. Wow, a church. So let, let it become a religion. Wow. A society which should have its members in every part of British Empire working with one object, one idea, we should have its members placed at our universities and our schools and should watch the English youth passing through their hands, just one perhaps in every thousand, would have the mind and feelings for such an object. He should be tried in every way, he should be tested, whether he is endurant, possessed of eloquence, disregardful of the petty details of life, and if found to be such, then elected and bound by oath to serve the rest of his life in his country. Now, I, I posted on the first video this very quote, you know, and it goes to show the medal of the man. And what, what he was about was uh, total subjugation. Total subjugation of everybody that wasn't white. I'll move on should then be supported, if without means, by society and set to that part of the empire where it was felt he was needed. 
In his will, Rhodes authorised provisions for the extension of British rule throughout the world, the colonisation by British subjects of all lands where the means of li livelihood are attainable by energy, labour and enterprise, and especially the occupation of British settlers of the entire continent of Africa, the Holy Land, the Valley of Euphrates, the islands of Cyprus and Candia, the whole of South America, the islands of Pacific, not herefore to possessed by Great Britain, the whole of the Malay archipelago, the seaboard of China and Japan, the ultimate recovery of the United States of America as an integral part of the British Empire. So yeah, he, he, he was beyond ambitious. He wanted the world because you pretty much encompass in the world there, except for Europe, of course, because, you know, that they were the old game. You, you can't fool the old gamers. <clears throat> this was the same British network of families, including the Huxley clan, the Cadburys, the Darwins, and the Wedgwoods, and banking interests with offshoots in North America and the west of Europe which spawned the early 20th century eugenics movement. Absolutely. Notice that word there, the Darwins. He's the one that spearheaded it, Charles Darwin. He set, ran the zoos and said men were base animals. They directed British colonial strategy and official science. Eugenics claimed that the English upper class ruled because they were genetically superior. Let that sink in for a minute. Wonder what the uh, upper class and the elite think today. Yeah? I think it's exactly the same thing. They think that we're here to be ruled. The English masters humoured themselves with the doctrine enforced on their beaten down subjects in India which the English reduced to starvation and political impotence by closing native industries yeah absolutely like salt mining for a start and in South Africa under white rule these were the very same families who funded Hitler absolutely uh, if you, you want to look into who funded Hitler it's a very uh, it's a very long and varied story. Uh, let's just m mention one family right off the bat. The Bush family. Look look, look at Prescott Bush and uh, how he got into trouble for funding Hitler. But we'll move on. And exerted their influence over German banking systems to have him appointed Chancellor in 1933. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how they did that. Maybe you should go into uh, the first video I did, what's really happening Russia v. USA, because it's got a very interesting story in there on how they took influence over the German banking system. But let's move on. <clears throat> in 1917, while World War I, I was still raging Lord Lothian, one of Lord Milner's most important protégés, suddenly departed from his previously fanatical anti-German rhetoric. As soon as Germany is crushed, he said, let us rearm and remilitarize it under the most reactionary leaders and point Germany towards war with Russia and France. Yeah, I wonder why. Would it, would it be something to do with, especially Russia, being a beacon of, of freedom before communism took over? I don't know. 1933 is a bit late after that. Now, you, now you're talking about a new regime. But before that, when you had the royal family, the Rom Romanovs in there, they were exactly that. They were beacon and freedom, and Europe hated them for it. Not so much about France, but definitely Russia. This was done 16 years later in 1933. At the same time, the Anglo-Saxon Saxon eugenics doctrine was imported into Germany to help shape Nazi rule. Yeah, absolutely, eugenics was a big part of, of what the Nazis were all about. You know, uh, the master race. 
eugenics all the way. The cabal called for the sterilization or euthanizing of unfit members of society to spare the expense of their lives, much like today's privatized HMO system functions. And these policies have always been a doctrine of racial aggression. Yeah, look, this is a big game of divide and conquer people. Big game, right? This is the game that, that people don't dig themselves into and, and understand. You know, this is why I'm non-racist in any any way, shape, or form because I understand that the games that the people play. These are uh, high-class, elite people that think they're better than us. This is the game they play. That's why I don't play the game. In 1932, the Third International Eugenics Conference was held in New York City, chaired by a rabid bigot, Fairfield Osborne, who, like-minded nep nephew, would later create the Cons Conservation Foundation. Osborne was president of the American Museum of Natural History and a close colleague of the notoriously racist Julian Huxley. Yeah. <laughs> and the co-host of the conference, the Harriman family. <laughs> no surprises there to me. No surprises. You know, uh, all you have to do is dig into a, a bit of this and you will find all their dirty little secrets. All of them. Okay, Rhodesia. The state was named after Cecil John Rhodes, whose British South Africa company acquired the land in the 19th century. The state was governed by a predominantly white minority government until 1979. Initially as a self-governing colony then, after the unilateral get declaration of independence as a self-proclaimed uh, sovereign dominion and latterly a republic. Throughout its history, Rhodesia continued to be referred to by the British who did not recognise the state as Southern Rhodesia. Yeah, well, why would they recognise the state that they've been raping for near a hundred years? You know, why recognise it? That would just give, a, give it legitimacy, wouldn't it? Rhodes has been portrayed by uh, Dr. C. McBailey File as a violent and brutal racist who used forced labour tactics as a means of founding the beers and other portions of his lucrative success. Ian Smith promised the whites who elected him Prime Minister of Rhodesia in 1982 that he would keep Rhodesia white at any cost to stop the black guerrilla fighters trying to overthrow his regime, which he eventually failed at. Smith rationed food for Africans whom he believed were feeding the guerrillas. This cruel measure only served to starve the already undernourished black population. Yeah, and it pissed them off. It pissed them off so much that they're, even to this day they're still going around killing white farmers in Zimbabwe. So studies found that over 90% of Rhodesia's black children were malnourished and nutritional deficiencies were the major cause of infant death. Smith rounded up blacks into concentration camps he called protective villages. Oh, Jesus, don't they give them the most glorious names, eh? Yeah? <laughs> Believing that ignorant people are less likely to revolt. Yeah, and that's why they call them these things. He cut funding for black education, spending $5 on each black child compared to $80 on each white child. His all-white parliament passed a law protecting officials who took actions for the suppression of terrorism enabling the police and military to commit atrocities. An international trade boycott against Rhodesia arose, but while the US public can condemn the government, it continued to do business there. In 1971, President Nixon lifted the chrome embargo against Rhodesia at a time when there was a surplus of chrome in the US. Blacks were eventually given the right to vote for some officials but the opposition to Smith's government grew so strong that he was ultimately forced to give up some power to blacks. In 1979, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, a country primarily ruled by blacks. Yes, and that's when the shit started hitting the fan for the white man in that country. Can you blame them, though? Can you honestly blame them? 
not at all. You know, I, I, I looked at it when it first started happening as just desserts. You can't subju uh, subjugate a race of people for so long that the, you're sitting in their land, you're a minority in their land, and then when they finally do come to power, well, what did you expect? What did you expect? So yeah, here's, here's uh, Cecil Rhodes lying around, watching his uh, millions get bloody uh, mined out of the ground for him. Scumbag. Rhodes to hell. What was the father of Rhodesia really? The epitome of pure evil? This is by Peter Goodwin. When I was growing up in Rhodesia, the foreboding image of Cecil John Rhodes, our founder, glowered from banknotes and coins and from the obverse side of the medical white boys, a media, a metal white boys, sorry, were awarded for doing national service in the Rhodesian security forces. It was a brooding face of livid complexion, a prominent nose overhanging, disproving jowls and a drooping moustache. Even then he struck me as an unlikely visionary and hero. Rhodes is a story in an un inherently implausible one. A sickly asthmatic vicar's son from Bishop Strat Stortford, England, heads to South Africa for the sake of his health and ends up the richest man in the Western world and the coloniser of a vast tract of Africa. Rhodes had three simultaneous careers in his 49 years. Diamond magnate, politician and imperialist. His big idea was to save Africa from itself. Only after his death in 1902 did the dizzying, dizzying extent of his imperial fantasy become apparent. In his will he left a fortune for the establishment of a secret society modelled on the Jesuits with the aim of extending British rule throughout the world. He was one of few men in history, apart from Simon uh, Bolivar, who managed to get a sizable mainland country named after himself. Two countries, actually, northern and southern Rhodesia. Only one person toppled that, the Italian-born explorer, uh, Amerigo Vespucci, who claimed an entire continent. Of course, northern Rhodesia became Zim Zambia in 1964, and when southern Rhodesia was jettisoned for Zimbabwe in 1980, the new black government began energetically wiping away all signs of the man. I tell you what, glorious day for the people there in Zimbabwe. <clears throat> in the New South Africa, Rhodes statue still clings to the side of Cape Town's Table Mountain. Uh, not anymore. They pulled it down. <laughs> Which sort of uh, uh, lends me to going... Uh, into something else that uh, Tony Abbott uh, a former Prime Minister of Australia pretty much came out and said he says uh, Tony Abbott tells Oxford University not to remove statue of Cecil Rhodes right uh, this is a statue of Cecil Rhodes that was removed from the University of Cape Town April 9 uh, 2011 I believe that's supposed to say but anyway I'll go into it former Prime Minister Tony Abbott has enraged students at Oxford University by warning the institution would damage its standing if it removed the statue of Cecil Rhodes from one of its colleges a campaign called Rhodes Must Fall has been calling for the removal of a statue from Oxford's Oriel College for some months on the grounds that Rhodes was a racist imperialist who implemented the first apartheid policies in South Africa. Well, absolutely true, and the people that, that uh, signed up to Rhodes Must Fall, I congratulate them, you know, for understanding the history of it. He was recently described by one Oxford University student campaigner as the Hitler of Southern Africa, no doubt. He was worse than Hitler. He really was. He really was. 
because the, the effects of what he's, he did in Africa are still felt today, to this very day. But Mr. Abbott has warned against the removal of the statue, describing such a move as moral vanity and saying it would damage Oxford's standing as a great university. Now, how would it do that, Mr. Abbott? How would it do that? I think would enhance Oxford's standing as a great university by getting rid of that absolute monster from out the front of Oriel College. You've got to be kidding yourself. But, we'll, uh, you know, we'll find out why he thinks this in the next part. In an email to The Independent, Mr Abbott said students at the college should be clear-eyed about Rhodes, faults and failings, but proud of his achievements. Really? Really? Proud of his achievements? Mr Abbott, you have to be kidding me, son. Absolutely kidding me. What have you been smoking? Hey? And these are the fools that we've got in public life in Australia today. Absolute fools. The university should remember that its mission is not to reflect fashion but to seek truth and that means striving to understand before rushing to judge. Yes, yes, I think the people that uh, want to pull this uh, hideous bloody uh, statue down fully understand. I don't think it's you who fully understand, sir. Racism is a dreadful evil, but we all know that now it's hardly virtuous to be against racism today. Real virtue would have been to oppose racism when it was difficult to do so. Well, who was, who was opposing Cecil Rhodes? Who was opposing Cecil Rhodes? What? The Boers. That would be about the only people that I've ever heard of that, that tried to oppose him. The Zulus. Yeah? Right. It's a pity that Rhodes was in many respects a man of his times. We can lament that he failed to oppose unjust features on his society while still celebrating the genius that led to the creation of the Rhodes Scholarship, Mr Abbott Road. Mr. Abbott himself was a Rhodes Scholar. Boom, tish. There you go. There you go. And just, uh, he was our former Prime Minister, probably two Prime Ministers ago. I don't know, because they went in quick succession after him. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the uh, Prime Minister of Australia now is also, guess what, a Rhodes Scholar. I'll continue. Rhodes was not a campaigner against racism, but many of the scholars who are his legacy have been. The Oxford University campaign comes under the University of Cape Town removed its own statue of Rhodes amid jubilant seeds in April this year. Now look at that. It's wonderful to see. People understand what this man actually did to their own country and the countries around them and decide... We're not going to worship this man anymore. We're not going to have him as a statue. Let's get rid of it. The removal came after a month-long protest by students citing the statue's great symbolic power, which glorified someone who exploited black labour and stole land from Indigenous people. And that's exactly what he'd done. A similar debate played out in America's South in 2015, culminating in the South Carolina State Legislature voting to take down the Confederate flag from its parliamentary building. Mr Abbott's decision to enter the debate about the Rhodes statue at Aurilla College has provided div uh, divisive with some outrage by the move and others perhaps mindful of his year's image uh, of this year's images of ISIS destroying statues in Syria and Iraq applauding his contribution. Well, I'm not even really going to go into the, uh, a couple of numpties on friggin' uh, Twitter or Facebook posting stuff, all right? Because that's all it is, you know. A couple of Neville's saying something I don't really care about. Uh, so I'm going to leave 
part two at this. <clears throat> There's definitely going to be a part three on um, the Rhodes Scholarship and what kind of a secret society it is. And there'll be even a part four on how uh, this uh, man and his policies translated into foreign policy for Britain and how it affects us today. So thanks for, thanks for watching. Um, if you like, subscribe. If not, it's all good. And I'll see you next time.